Um, so welcome everyone to this webinar on supporting patients experiencing poverty-related mental distress. Um, I think everyone will agree that with the current cost of living crisis, this is a really important topic to be discussing right now. So thank you everyone for tuning in and joining us today. Um, I will give an overview of the agenda for the session and uh, before passing to the first speaker, just a few uh, reminders. So cameras and microphones are off by default for, for the audience. Um, questions for the speakers are very welcome. Just post them into the chat. Um, and the event is being recorded for posting to the University of Exeter YouTube channel. So just be aware of that if you would like to turn your camera on at any point. So. Um, agenda for this session, we're going to hear from Dr. Felicity Thomas from Exeter University about the De-Stress 2 project. We'll hear how the project has developed training resources to support primary care health professionals, better support patients experiencing poverty-related mental distress, and hear about the uptake of that training and the impact it's had so far. We'll then hear from uh, our de-stress community partners who will talk about why they got involved and how they've been working alongside the research team and GPs um, in, uh, throughout this project. And finally, uh, we're gonna be joined by Dr. Mark Horowitz who will discuss the efficacy of antidepressants and his work at the uh, drug deprescribing clinic in Northeast London. Um, we'll spend about 20 minutes with each speaker and then we'll have time at the end in the last uh, 20 minutes, half an hour for questions. So I really hope uh, you enjoy the session and I will hand over to Felicity Thomas now. Thanks, Elsa. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, um, let's put that on to there. Can everybody see that? Is that okay? Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, well, thank you everybody for coming along today. It's really lovely to have so many people join us um, in this session today. I'm going to talk, as Elsa says, about the DeStress 2 project. This is a collaboration between three ARC regions, ARC meaning Applied Research Collaborations, and this is the Penin Peninsular Arc in the Southwest, the Northwest Coast Arc and the North Thames Arc. And together, our research team come from across six universities. So the De-Stress 2 project ran between 2021 and now, and it builds on findings from a large scale qualitative study that ran from 2016 to 2019. that looked, on the impacts, looked at the impacts of austerity and welfare reform on mental health in low income communities. So just to give a bit of context to the project, um, the number of prescriptions for antidepressants in England has almost doubled in the past decade. And within many low-income communities, the use of antidepressant medication is especially high. And you can see on the map on the left there, the red areas are largely coastal and post-industrial areas. And what we're seeing is that these, um, and that's where antidepressant is it prescribing is highest. What we're also seeing is, is that these drugs are taken over much longer periods of time than was the case in the past. Now, much of the evidence around antidepressant effectiveness is based on studies with people with severe depression. And this is something that's very often not made that clear to patients. Most patients in primary care are in the mild to moderate range for which evidence suggests a relatively low effect size or number needed to treat, meaning that for the majority of people, antidepressants are unlikely to really be of much benefit. And this matters not just because people may be, may be being given unhelpful medications, but also because there's a potential for adverse harm. There's a lot of evidence to suggest potentially harmful side effects, including emotional blunting, which affects people's ability to feel joy, excitement, enthusiasm, and other emotions, um, weight gain, insomnia, decreased libido, nausea, and, and other things too. And we know from our previous work that high antidepressant prescribing can, can actually feel really disempowering for low-income patients, particularly when people have actually taken quite a lot of time to build the courage to actually go and seek help for their mental health issues in the first place. At the same time, what we know from our, our work is that prescribing antidepressants in these kinds of situations can also leave doctors feeling really conflicted and unsatisfied when they feel that what they're doing isn't 
necessarily going to be of great benefit to the patient. So in terms of the policy context of the project, the project fits pretty well really with recent policy shifts, especially the community mental health framework for adults and older adults, the NHS long-term plan, and the updated NICE guidance on depression. However, there's currently very little guidance available on what these approaches might mean for the delivery of healthcare consultations and how staff, in particular GPs, might move from a, a fixing through prescribing role to more of a sort of supportive role, or how they can work most effectively to support patients alongside social prescribers and the other people that make up what are increasingly expanding and diverse primary care teams. So if we look at the aims of the project, well, the core aim of the project was to test possibilities for initiating a shift in cu current cultures of prescribing and antidepressants, of antidepressants in primary health care, particularly in relation to poverty-related mental distress. And to do this, we wanted to develop training that could realistically be completed by a high volume of very busy health professionals and, and training that introduced a few key concepts that could bring about realistic changes in practice and that could be done in a way that GPs in particular didn't feel was us criticising their existing work, particularly in light of the enormous pressures that we know they've faced in recent years. So this included developing training that first off introduced a framework for addressing social causes of distress in a more person-centred way, considering language and introducing scripts that could be used to engender empathy and create space for the patient to feel listened to and heard. Um, secondly, what we were seeing in our previous work is that doctors very broadly fell into two camps. Now, of course, there are exceptions. We do appreciate that. Um, but broadly, we saw that there were GPs who were adopting a bit of a sort of paternalistic approach to these patients and saw them as people who needed medications to be fixed. Or alternatively, as people who had social problems that GPs felt wasn't really their business to get involved with. And that meant that a really important questions around broader socioeconomic circumstances were not being asked within consultation. And in both scenarios, the prescribing of medication was the usual response. So we wanted the training to help health professionals better understand the background and needs of their low-income patients um, and to know how to work with them to identify their strengths and goals rather than just approaching them in, in a sort of deficit-based best, based way, which is what medications prescribing can do. Um, and to be able to feel confident to understand and impart information on the limitations of antidepressants and explore alternatives to them. And finally, we wanted the training to give health professionals the confidence and legitimacy to know when to act in this sort of more supportive role. So the DeStress 2 training materials were, were co-developed during this project by researchers, GPs, and our brilliant team of community partners. And this was an iterative process where we developed and delivered training in person, we got feedback on the feasibility and impact from both those delivering the training and those receiving the training. And we refined the process as we went and we tried to learn from our mistakes. If anyone today is listening who is involved in stage one, you will know that things were far from perfect in stage one. But eventually we got to a stage where we felt that what we had was the basis of a solid training package that could be rolled out more widely across the country. We recognised that delivering training in person was not going to be practical on a large scale. So we wanted to develop a resource that could be led by practices and done at a time that suited them and that generated reflective group discussion that would help uh, prompt both individual and practice-based change. So in phase two, we used feedback from the in-person training that we got in phase one to develop the online resource with the intention that this could be facilitated within the practice team and once tested, made available to practices across England. In full recognition of the really extreme pressures on the primary care system across England, the training advocates small adaptations to usual care that can take place within existing um, primary care consultations as and when that's deemed appropriate by health providers. The training does not advocate that GPs and other health professionals stop medication prescribing where this is not felt to be appropriate or, or advantageous to the patient, rather that they consider adapting consultation practice so that non-medical responses which identify and draw on personal strengths are also given full consideration. So to deliver this training and to assess the impact of this training, we had a two-stage methodology. In stage one, uh, this involved the training of trainers. We, we trained uh, GPs and community partners from across three areas of England with fairly diverse demographic characteristics, so the southwest, the northwest coast area and the North Thames region. 
Um, we did focus groups with people from low income backgrounds to get an understanding of their experiences in primary care. We've done a lot of focus groups in our earlier piece of, of work. We just wanted to help ensure that our earlier findings kind of were still relevant. Um, we identified practices in the three study areas that had high antidepressant prescribing and high levels of socioeconomic deprivation, and we targeted those through the training. In stage one, we delivered training in person to 508 health professionals across 53 practices, and we used the feedback from this to develop our online resource. In stage two, approximately 150 people in 30 practices from across England did the online training. When health professionals felt they delivered a consultation in line with the de-stress training, they were asked to give patients a link to a survey where patients could give anonymous feedback on how they felt the consultation had gone. Um, that was available through a QR link or also um, through a hard copy. Uh, we collected a total of 106 patient surveys across the study, and we did 67 follow-up interviews with health professionals who'd done the training to get their feedback about their experiences of the training and what they saw as the barriers and enablers to implementing the messages in the training. And also we wanted to see if there'd been any, any early impact on, on people's practice. And of course, a lot has changed in terms of primary care practice in the time we've been running this project. We're seeing practice teams getting more varied with a range of allied health professionals now also seeing patients. So we ensured that the training was available to anybody that wanted to come along from the practice. So along with GPs, we also delivered the training to practice nurses, social prescribers, pharmacists, administrators, and so on. Um, and in terms of where we did the study, so these are our first three sites, and these are the other sites that took part in stage two. So you can see it's kind of quite a large area of England that took part in one way or another. Um, I just wanted to flag this, this slide just so you can kind of get an idea of some of the core discussion points that we had in the focus groups, but also in the stage one training. Um, we, we talked a lot about high levels of dissatisfaction amongst low-income patients using primary mental health care, the general lack of awareness amongst both patients, but also health providers in terms of the limitations of antidepressants, the hugely varied ways in which practices work across the country, um, pressures within primary care, which can help fuel medicalization and the potential for um, improved team working. And, um, this was a sort of mind map um, that one of the team put together which, where we drew together all of the ideas and all of our findings just to um, help us to, to put together our online resource in stage two. So we worked with a visual ethnographer to develop the resource. Um, lots of community partner involvement in this. They star very heavily within the um, training materials, lots of film clips with the community partners talking about their own experiences. There was a lot of GP involve, involvement, including from our trainers, but also from other health professionals, including Mark Horowitz, who we're delighted is here with us today. Um, so these are just a few kind of clips from various parts of the training package, just so you can get a sense of what's in it. So how has all of this landed with, with patients and with health professionals? Um, like I said, patients um, who had received a consultation, which health professionals felt was influenced by the training, were asked to do this short anonymous follow-up survey. And these quotes here were really typical of the response that we received. 101 of the 106 respondents felt that the de-stress style consultation they had received was appropriate for their needs. So that's about 95%. Um, 76 survey participants actually went out of their way to make really positive comments about their consultation, explicitly praising the health professional's skills in learning and in showing compassion and empathy. Of those who made any negative comments, and there were only really a handful, um, only two were actually about the style of the consultation. Other negative comments were really about the length of the time that people had had to wait for an appointment, or the fact that they had to see somebody different from the last time they'd, they'd been into the, into the surgery. But generally, really, really positive comments from patients. So in terms of the feedback we got from health professionals, um, health professionals interviewed were overwhelmingly positive about the online training in stage two, with all the interviews asked, who were asked stating that they would recommend it to others. The scripts and the film clips of patient lived experience and the reflective group discussion were all highly highlighted as being especially helpful. And as you can see in the quote here, it was evident that opportunities for practice teams to come together to specifically focus on issues relating to poverty and mental distress were quite uncommon. 
despite this being something that takes up a considerable practice workload, but it was seen as a really welcome intervention by people. And we talked about the barriers um, to delivering this kind of consultation. And not surprisingly, commonly people talked about uh, GP consultation times not being long enough to really support patient need. And that asking about broader circumstances would open up challenging conversations that couldn't then be properly addressed and, and available. And several people commented that this was especially the case as the day went on and they got behind with their appointment schedule. Um, one GP who was really aligned to the messages in the training um, you know, said that, you know, sometimes you just have to write prescriptions to save time in the short term so that you can deal with patients with more urgent issues. And time was especially seen as a barrier in consultations that were considered to be more complex, particularly when interpreters were required. Um, and there was also a perception amongst some that patients who'd come to the UK from other countries might have a different expectation about what a consultation should, should be. The idea of patient agency and shared decision making were not necessarily seen as a cultural norm or expectation for everybody. Some, some people also commented that when you've got locum doctors, you might be less invested in a patient. It's also harder to guarantee this kind of consultation. Um, waiting for other services was also emphasised as a really major issue and one that led to antidepressants being prescribed as a stopgap. And this reinforces earlier what we've done in this field where doctors feel they need to give a prescription to show they're giving the patient something. And you can see this quite clearly in these quotes here, this idea about not leaving a, a patient with nothing when you know that the time frame for therapy or other sort of other support is going to likely be months or years away. Um, for some... Some people saw um, sort of embedded practices of working as being a barrier as well. Um, like I mentioned earlier, for a, minor, for a minority of GPs we spoke to, dealing with social issues wasn't really considered part of their role. You can see that on the quote on the left. Others recognised that they've been practising as, as a GP for a very long time and they may be fairly sort of entrenched in their ways of working and they felt that might impact on their practice too. Um, Primary care networks, the merging of practices, all of this, these shifts in primary care are quite new for a lot of people, as is the introduction of social prescribers and other allied health professionals into primary care teams. And it's very clear that many people were still trying to find their way here. And there was a real lack of team awareness very often around roles and remits and, and, a, and a lack of coordination across practices within the same primary care network. Um, you know, there's no standard way of running a practice, but there was a lack of lack of awareness quite often that other practices might work differently. People saw what they were doing as being the norm without reflecting on how this had come to be the case. Um, and there were also some evidence of hierarchies within practice teams, which you can see from, in a quote on the right, which were seen as an obstacle to changing um, embedded ways of working. So that's sort of the barriers. And if we look at the enablers um, to implementing a de-stress uh, style consultation, those who felt, felt that it was a welcome validation of their existing practice were keen to continue or to expand working in this way. And they really appreciated being told that it was okay to do this. And it wasn't, so, as, this, as many people said to us, that wasn't something that they normally heard from others. So sort of feeling that it was okay was really important to people. And this helped to open up a discussion within the training about what people had found worked in practice. So share, they were sharing ideas with others in the practice in a way that they hadn't really had the chance to do or felt able to do before. Some people talked about training leading to a heightened awareness of using a biopsychosocial model and explaining this to patients, as well as the importance of the language used within consultations. And there was a recognition that this was probably going to take a bit more time in an, in, in an initial con consultation, but actually it was a good investment of time if it meant you got to the core issues earlier on. So it's a sort of a slightly different way of thinking about time and how this can be best invested, as you can see in these two quotes here, uh, which came from two different GPs in the Southwest. Um, and the second one sort of says it's a, it's a different way of getting to the same point. It's not necessarily a longer way if you think about the whole consultation process beyond that first consultation. If you take a sort of longer term view, actually, it might save you time in the long run. Another enabler was when people felt that the training was legitimised and emboldened them to take on more of a supportive role. And this was really evident amongst allied health professionals who found that the scripts we included in the training were really helpful in opening up discussion and showing compassion and empathy. And, and many GPs also commented on the usefulness of this too. 
People felt that they had a better recognition of the role of poverty as a causal influence for mental distress, and the training helped them to realise the importance of acknowledging this within a consultation. A number of people commented that they'd never asked questions about what they saw as difficult issues around things like, like money because they were worried that it might offend the patient. And the training helped them to ask these questions around finances and around broader life circumstances and realise that actually most patients were generally fine with this. Um, and then health professionals said that yeah, they'd tried doing this and they felt it had really enabled them to work better and identify the positive step forward with their patients. A really important enabler was recognising what kind of message prescribing might convey to a patient. You can see in the quote here, the GP says that the training helped them to recognise that by giving medications, you, know, you, you may be perceived as implying there's something wrong with the person rather than their situation. And that recognising this could be a really pivotal way to which then help build more of a strength-based approach to work with alongside the patients to identify steps forward for them. I'm not going to say much on this now because I think our community partners will probably cover this brilliantly in a minute. Um, the training was also seen as really helpful in providing a better understanding of the limitations and potential harms of antidepressants and the importance of presenting a range of treatment and support options is equally valuable. In none of the patient surveys that we got back did anyone complain that they hadn't been given medications. Um, Recognising the potential of proactive team working was also a really big enabler. Training and reflective discussion um, that it prompted helped to also demystify roles. And that was especially for, uh, valuable for the allied health professionals who said that before then they, they weren't really sure what GPs did in, in their consultations. You know, they hadn't sat in on a consultation with a GP, so they didn't know what those kind of consultations looked like. Um, but it was also helpful for, for some GPs who hadn't really appreciated the potential offered by the wider team, and in particular, the social prescribers within their teams. In terms of early impact, um, what we've seen is that the training, or people have said that the trainings helped open up broader discussions, better referrals across practice teams, sharing learning and, and providing collective support for a patient, um, thinking about the bigger picture, who in the practice might be best place to help um, and, and answering questions to understand this, sorry, asking questions to understand this better. And then finally, one practice in the Southwest who actually said, well, you know, they'd sat down and had a discussion to say, well, we don't need to follow up patients, just, just the patients who've been prescribed medications. We could follow up the patients who we didn't prescribe to as well. And that's something that they're seriously considering now too. So already you can see a lot of positive intention and some positive action already, despite it only being a couple of months or less uh, in some cases since the training took place. Obviously, and knowing that cultural shifts don't happen overnight, what we'd like to be able to do is go back to practices in a few months to find out what's happened further down the line and whether the changes are sort of long lasting. Um, and we're also exploring ways to make the training available nationally. So that's where we're currently at with the project. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to our amazing community partners on the project. I'm delighted that um, many of them are here today with us. I want to thank our brilliant GP trainers, everyone who participated in the project, the project funders, fantastic project team across the three regions, and there's some, uh, a link to further information if anyone would like to know more. So thank you very much for listening. I should stop sharing my slides. Thank you so much, Felicity, for that. I'm sure people will be, I can see people are already posting questions in the chat. Um, so please continue to do so and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so as you've just heard, we've worked with a team of around 20 community partners throughout this work um, who have used their lived experience to help develop the training materials and deliver the training. Um, the plan was to hear from three of them today um, Philip, Debbie and Ralph. Philip unfortunately couldn't make it today, but he has made a video that he wanted us to share with you. So I'm going to uh, attempt to play that now um, and then I'll hand over to Debbie and Ralph who will uh, talk to you about their experiences. So let me uh, share this video.
I was on my own. I was on my own. I'm living in is anything to anyone down Portobello Road, and you know it was I was a young man and whatever, and I was about how old? Blimey, in my early twenties. So it wasn't long ago, and then um, basically, uh, yeah, I, I I was feeling very low, very very depressed. I wasn't eating much. My mental health was right. Was one of the uh, it's a stigmatized mental health I felt because. I didn't, I was working in, in an environment where I couldn't be mental health problems. I couldn't have mental health problems in. And I had to hide that from my employer. So in fact, I was hiding my whole life actually. <laughs> when I did go to see a GP myself on the first time, um, I was, yeah, I was not not very, very happy in the way I was treated, to be honest. I, I, I was, was given medication and sent on my way. My introdu introduction to mental health was not a good one. The yeah. hospitals were absolutely appalling at those during those times. I mean, nowadays they're a lot better because I know that because I inspect them with my CQC work. But all I'll say is that back then it was like Stone Age times. I mean, the, the treatment was appalling. I was angry. I was always being getting into trouble on, on the ward in the hospital with the doctors and everything. I was having a go at everyone. Um, yeah, if they didn't let me, let me go outside for my, I used to smoke back then. But if I didn't let me have a fag or whatever, or go outside for a fag, I used to pick up the chair and throw it through the, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I was known quite famous for the chairs. Um, but no, um, no, I was angry. I was angry. I was angry anyway, but also that angered me even more was the conditions that, and the way they treated the other patients, I saw them, the way they used to talk. There was no confidentiality between patient to patient. You know, you, you knew everything about everyone in there. It was ridiculous. And I thought, this isn't the place for me. I don't want everyone. I hate this, that they talk about me in front of other people. I, I was so lucky because I got, I got somebody called an employment specialist. And she, she told me, why don't I go to the gym? Why don't I do this? Why don't I swim? Because I, I love swimming and stuff like that. So I decided I, I took up swimming. It wasn't. And then when I started to get involved with uh, Exeter University and the, and the partners and everything else, and, and also dealing with, you know, having to do, deal with this situation and face it head on, I realized, right, I've got to do this, you know really got to do this i'm not doing it for me i'm doing it for everyone else as well and i've got to do it and i'm going to let all these people down if i don't go because i wasn't going to go i was absolutely petrified um i was very scared about the reaction that i would get from the other gps and also reactions from others as well i really value these group sessions that we have all right i mean i feel like i know every single one of you so well it's unbelievable you're almost like my own little, own little family of some sort you know it's been honestly without it it's been, it, it would have been really oh i'm about to cry stop this no thanks to everybody because everybody has their own sort of problems issues that they're dealing with and it's made those issues my issues lighter than what they would have been the beginning stage say. of the fear of going to be delivering and then doing the delivery, then coming back into the room again with, all, with everyone and delivering what you felt it went and how they felt it went. So yeah, there was a lot of, there was like, that's how I felt. I felt I was being supported 360 degrees wise for via the group in the early stages. Yeah. Because without the group, I wouldn't have done the delivery. I'm sorry to say, I really wouldn't have done. Uh, I don't think I could have done it. Not that I wouldn't want to do it. It's mm -hmm. a case of, I don't think I was able to do it. In the very beginning, we didn't know you, you didn't know us. You know, we were expecting, we were expected to go out there and give our heart over to these GP surgeries, you know, and what was going to happen with that, you know, with that information, you know, that was a fear factor. There was a lot of fear going on for me anyway when i was when we first started and then we started to build that rapport the trust and all that kind of thing and then it became this group became what it is today um i yeah it was it was my, it's mind-boggling actually how, how i managed to do it to be honest and i look back at it today and i even think 
even today when I'm doing online training or something like that and I'm presenting, like there's there Philip's got a 50 minute slot or something to talk about frailty, for instance, which is like an elder older person's care. And I'm sitting there before the 50 minutes still panicking. I'm like, I still get that panic. But once I'm, once the mic's on and it's down to you, off you go. I'm I'm away. I'm I'm going for it. So it's brilliant. So thanks to that project, it's given me that self esteem. It's given me all that. It's given me my mojo back, basically. So yeah, um, my life changed because I was able to talk in a in a group, in a mass, and everything else at work, and also at other different venues for different charities and stuff like that, which I was volunteering for at that particular time. And I was able to start talking to people. And now I'm teaching people. I mean, I can't believe I said that, you know, and that was a year ago when we first started the, uh, you know, talking to working with partners and also working with this project. Um, so thank you to Philip who isn't here today, but I'm still going to thank him for um, producing that video for us. Um, so now I think I can hand over to Debbie and Ralph, who are going to talk to us a bit more. Hi, I'm not sure I'm going to follow that. And Philip made me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's been wonderful to work with your community partners and to the team. And I became involved in January last year and I've suffered uh, for a long time with mental health. I've married for 30 years and I struggled to reach out for help. Um, I've been dragged along to GP surgeries over the years, didn't want to go, didn't know how to talk. Uh, I've been given antidepressants and I'm on, on just on waiting lists for um, therapies. And, um, and I was just very embarrassed. I was very embarrassed that I wasn't coping with life. Um, and um, I really, really struggled. to struggled to open up to anybody. I couldn't make any house. I couldn't have any, couldn't do anything really. Um, up and down. And uh, I was I was working, managing to hold down a job about six months at the time. And then I had to have time off because it all, all got too much and uh, got a few months off and then we were embarrassed that I was having the team down so I went back way too soon and then spiraled to start again and uh, I was really lucky because um, I got amazed I went to the job centre I've never ever ever been on benefits in my life I had to because I'd given up another job couldn't cope with it and uh, he called me in um, in lockdown and uh, he realised that I was really poorly and he put me through for a referral and I had the first main name they referred me, but they, they, they basically said I wasn't fit for, fit for work and I felt even more embarrassed that I wasn't fit for work. And they they gave me some time, said we, we'd like you to take this time to get find out what you need in your life. They realised that I'd gone through in the past and relocated and everything was just a mess. And, um, and it felt like I had that pressure taken off. I felt really embarrassed that I couldn't work, but it was the best thing for me because it gave me some time and I I, I got referred to this amazing group called 100 Women Group and um, they they uh, helped, they provided, they paid for me to have extra life coaching, counselling, courses, uh, yoga nidra, which is a guided relaxation, which really helped calm me down. I was with a group of women that knew what it was like to be in my situation. I've never spoken in the 30 years, I've never spoken about the situation I was in. So to be amongst women that knew without me even having to say anything, that helped me to be honest and open and to realise that I was going to the doctor hoping that he would wave the wand and fix me. Um, it didn't happen. I walked really really hard over the last few years to um to find out what i need i didn't know i didn't know i was a mum and a wife and that's it was at the bottom of the pile i didn't know who i was when i didn't think so but um so 100 women actually advertised this um 
this research project. I'd never worked on a research project before and uh, had an interview. And um, before I knew, I don't quite know how, but I got signed up to this um, this amazing group of people. And um, I was so nervous, so, so nervous when I came on the first call. And, and then, as Philip said, when they said, oh, you're going to go into GP surgeries and you're going to do some pregnant, I... No, I, I can't possibly, and I very, very nearly ran then because I was absolutely terrified. No way could I do it. But we had weekly, we had weekly talk, weekly two weekly talk groups where we could just drop in and out, no pressure at all, with the other community partners, um, with researchers, with Suzanne, who, with other staff members, and we just built the most amazing bond together and. I was on the project for six months before I even plucked up the courage to go into a GP surgery. But I watched I watched one of my other colleagues, Coral, Coral and I, and she very kindly allowed it to be videoed so I could watch it. And um, it took away some of the war, so I had a, I'd already built a relationship with her. And um, and I thought actually I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for the other people out there that are struggling and are in a black hole and don't know how to get out. So. That really helped and it also helped to go to the GP with the GP trainer because at the time when I was poorly I didn't have a voice I didn't know how to use my voice I hadn't had a voice for such a long time and now I'm on my recovery I I want to be able to explain how it feels when you when you don't know how to get through the day let alone how you're going to do it tomorrow so um it's helped me with my recovery. It's made me realise I'm a lot stronger than I than I ever thought I was. Um, it's it's given me the opportunity to branch out into other things and voluntary work now for other organisations that I didn't think I'd be able to work again. And I am and I'm doing it and I have to be very careful that I don't overwhelm myself and I know now how to how to how to look after me and if I'm looked after then I can be there for everybody else. So um so just want to say thank you for the opportunity of being part of this project and uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll just sum up so much in so little time. I had trained as a mental health peer support worker, which I thought would be my ticket back into paid employment, having been a carer for many years. And unfortunately, wasn't invited to my own graduation, wasn't told why. My careers coach from the primary care network chased it up and didn't get a reply either. So I was got, had gone from thinking I'd be back in work to uh, then sort of being lost and drifting and having my confidence. In it. And then I happened to sign up to an email group and I saw this thing about the de-stress project. So I was interviewed by Ilza, who's doing a magnificent job today, and did that day, and I broke down in tears, telling my story. And yeah, I got involved in this group of community partners. As Bobby said, we had a twice weekly drop-in um, with Suzanne, who won't want to sing our praises, but uh, we have to give our credit, Suzanne Hughes, for the record, <laughs> um, she has been a champion and a facilitator, and we've all learned skills. It's like an organic ecosystem of skills sharing and building, as Devon's described, as Philip described. So, yeah, I went from sort of being quite isolated, dejected, a bit sort of um, my self esteem had plummeted again to building confidence. In my case, I've actually done a lot of public speaking in the past. Um, but I, I had sort of fallen by the wayside. And the main reason for that was I was a carer for my son who had a medical misdiagnosis and um, malpractice. And I had become chronically ill with eczema, asthma, food allergies. And I often had anaphylactic shock, which is in itself quite traumatic. I had a partner, maybe because I wasn't so well, who was undiagnosed with um, unstable personality disorder. Um, 
Many, many people that never get a proper diagnosis, GPs, uh, from all of their skills and all of their resilience and all of the disaster thing, they're not diagnostic, they're not trained to be so to be able to give complex diagnostic uh, assessments for complex mental health needs. And I think they're putting the firing line equal to how teachers and police are putting the firing line to deal with difficulties in society. Society has been fragmented, people don't deal with things on a whole. And yeah, I've learned that mental health and recovery is about patterns, understanding patterns, holistic nature of things, and uh, cycles. And although we're talking about poverty related mental distress, the cycles of poverty that create the context in which we're in. And um, one of them is that there's a moral poverty with politicians across a number of parties, but particularly the one in Hell And um, I won't get any more political, I don't want to scare our sponsors. <laughs> but yeah, there's a there's a poverty of understanding of how people struggle with holistic difficulties and how not having enough money in your pocket can worsen them. problems. And one of the things that I did my recovery, even before these first projects, was that I went to the council that always been hostile in the past and they talked about income maximisation and putting me on a SMI form so that I didn't have to deal with council tax. So, I really was supported by a holistic infrastructure of people. And the key linchpin to that was my new GP. The old practice was found in constant. I often got what we call the screw case in each one when I'm entering, or when I wanted to talk about more than one thing related to what was going on for me. In contrast, my new GP, I was skeptical it was called E7 Health. I was like, oh, this is a conglomerate taking over my GP practice. But it was actually one of the first primary care networks in East London. And I had a brilliant GP who always finishes the consultation with that it's a pleasure talking to me, that he admires my parenting skills. And just, you know, it's like Felicity said, one of these sort of micro-therapeutic interventions that keeps you going when you're in an isolated wilderness and waiting for years for care. And in my case, often for primary talking therapies when actually I finally got referred to secondary um, services in the NHS where your mental health is taken more seriously where there's a, a sort of continuity of care, even though there's waiting um, lines. So, yeah, um, my life has been transformed, not only through the project, but through the holistic approach, having a social prescriber, many of the things for this to be Yet still, um, one thing I learned on this project is that at one point, Anyone correct me if this is wrong, but at one point uh, in history, not so long ago, up to 50% of adults in some towns in the UK have been on an SSI. 
by a long time. And yet, I spoke to a friend who lived in southern Lebanon, Lebanon and again, I was in search of this, but I was told that up to 80% of people are dependent on antipsychotics, SSRIs, and antidepressants. And, you know, we can see if the 50% of the people in the UK are on them, how could it, you know, what's you know, what's the devastation in conflict zones that um, are in the world? And I also read an article which I shared with Felicity that SSRIs are prescribed so widely that they're found um, in fish. <laughs> and all of this indicates that it's a plaster for a problem that is systemic and pandemic changes the world. Um, Really, a crisis that we're not only sleepwalking into, or sleepwalking into, and we're kind of being sold, which Mark will talk about more. This idea that you know you have, you have low serotonin and you need to boost it with SSRIs, rather than you may have a complex trauma and you have to help you shadow to go into the the amount of trauma I experienced as a youth and community worker in East London, the youths I worked with have been stabbed, one mom was murdered in broad daylight in the shopping centre, the levels of mental health, and I became a carer and more specialised in mental health. There's a huge ecosystem of people that support one another in the community. And again, I made that distinction. Financial policy and moral policy. And it's the moral policy for certain people in power that I think leads to the financial policy of others. And that's chronic, it's complex, it's hard to unpick. Um, three minutes. Um, yeah, and people that are suffering are our fellow human beings, our, our fellow citizens. Intergenerational damage is done when mental health isn't treated correctly. Um, when diagnoses are, are missed. Um, but there is excellent uh, practice now when the trying to turn that works. I consider de stress, and this is why I want to finish, um, as excellent. Uh, this is a second manifestation of this project, and I think we have to acknowledge. And we built it on the shoulders of giants like Karen and Colin and Keith, um, who's done a great job with the film work. Um, I need to acknowledge the sensitivity and brilliance of our GP trainers, one of which been trained with my GP, um, the community partners, the researchers, the coordinating team. And I scripted this bit that. De stress is one of the most beautiful projects I've ever been involved in, and I've been involved in literally hundreds of projects. Um, in terms of the level of integrity and dignity it affords people, especially us as community partners, who even when we've got the gift of the gap like myself, may have lost confidence. Uh, they created non-hierarchical spaces. I've never been on a project where, you know, a senior academic or senior academics and researchers will join a group. I think because it often did as much for them as it did for us as community partners, because after all, we all have mental health and we all uh, have experienced the stress with our mental health may yet experience that and that's the message I want to get through as well. We don't know when crisis will hit and turning crisis into opportunity like Debbie and Philip and other community partners have is a long process and ideally people wouldn't hit the crisis in the first place. So yeah, a very non-hierarchical, holistic project. And I also do a bit of coaching as well as mental health peer support. And I came across the idea that integrity is a mountain without top. 
and there's just great integrity in this project. Um, it's the last thing I want to say is that in mental health recovery, it's not only about having integrity towards each other and people within our interpersonal relationships, but we need to learn to have integrity for ourselves and to practice that integrity daily and to um, practice self-empowerment, self-development, self-love. And that's what this project was for me, being able to do that with myself, for myself, with others, and share that with GPs that are stuck in an battle group of people um, who are so important to consistency and continuity in mental health. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Debbie, for your bravery and everyone that's been so beautiful and kind and an amazing. And yeah, thank you all for attending and thank you. Thank you so much, Ralph and Debbie. You've been receiving lots of messages of support and appreciation in the chat, so thank you. Um, if you have any questions for either of them or other community partners who are with us here today in the UCLP boardroom, uh, put them in the chat and we will try and get to them at the end. Uh, right now, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Mark Horowitz. Uh, he's a, a training psychiatrist, a clinical research fellow in the NHS, and an honorary clinical research uh, research fellow at UCL. So, Mark, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Ilsa. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here, part of such a great project. Um, I, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about antidepressants. I think it's already been made pretty clear by um, people who have already spoken that uh, low mood and anxiety is generally caused by circumstances and it's helping people through those circumstances that makes the big difference. Uh, antidepressants can't really get to the core of those issues. Uh, and I should also apologize, people have spoken from the heart, very affecting stories, but I'm about to show you a bunch of graphs. I, I apologize, that's that's my style. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen, hopefully you can see uh, this. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a few different topics. Uh, and someone will let me know when I should uh, stop going on. Uh, look, I'm going to go straight into a graph, uh, straight into the deep end. I think people, I, I like to show this graph a lot. This is a graph produced by academics who work with drug companies on drug company data, and they use this to show that antidepressants work. It shows uh, antidepressants in blue only have a very small difference in terms of effect on depression compared to sugar tablets. I think people don't see this uh, graph enough. The placebo effect is very large. The antidepressant effect is very small. And this is all at six weeks. So that's when people talk about antidepressants, this is the effect they're talking about. There's also a, a question on uh, how big a difference makes a difference. There is, you can see from, from this graph, oops. Uh, the difference is, is about 2.7 points. In most studies, it's about two points. That's on a 52-point depression scale. Uh, what they asked in one study is they asked doctors, what do you think about this person? Do you think they're better? And what they found is when people had a three-point improvement, doctors couldn't see any change. When there was a seven-point improvement, they said it was minimally improved, and it took a 14-point difference people would say it was much improved. In other words, the two or two and a half point difference that antidepressants produce in, in people, most people wouldn't notice a difference. It's a very small effect. Uh, there are all sorts of other ways that drug companies uh, spin the data to make it seem more effective than it really is. Uh, number, I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out just a few of them. Number one is they don't publish all the studies. So if you look at published studies, 48 studies are positive and three are negative. When you go to the actual data that's given to the FDA in America, it's actually about half and half, about the same number of positives, a positive studies when the antidepressant is better than placebo and a negative study when there's no difference. So what is published and what informs guidelines, including the NICE guidelines, for example, is skewed by publication bias. Um, so the drugs are very much likely to be less effective than they appear to be in studies. 
another big a big issue in my mind is how short the studies are they go for six to 12 weeks most people take antidepressants for months or years and tolerance is a big issue with drugs like antidepressants uh, tolerance means the drug becomes less and less effective over time everyone knows that about caffeine it's also known for drugs like valium and for opioids they wear off over time so what happens at six weeks is not the same as what happens after five years and so uh, these studies with short-term uh, results will exaggerate how effective the drugs are and they're likely to have very little effect after several years and the last point is unblinding in these studies, people given antidepressants will have effects, nausea, headache, dizziness, that will tell them they're on the drug. We know that people who know they're on a drug will improve. That's what expectation effects are all about. There are studies where they isolate that expectation effect, and the expectation effect actually has been shown to be about twice as big as that two-point difference from sugar pills. So all of the effect of a drug may be down to people expecting to get better because they've been given a drug. It's a very powerful thought in people's minds. Uh, then I want to talk about the story that is given along with these drugs to people. Uh, there's an industry-presented story, which has really, really taken over our societal understanding of depression and antidepressants. has been incredibly successful. And the story goes... It's been called the disease-centered model by uh, Professor Joanna Moncrief, who's a professor of psychiatry at UCL. And the story goes like this. Depression is caused by low serotonin, colloquially known as the chemical imbalance. Antidepressants rectify, they fix this underlying imbalance. And antidepressants work like insulin for diabetes or like antibiotics for infection. And that is that has been that has infused medical education. A lot of doctors, GPs, psychiatrists think that. And if you think that, then why wouldn't you prescribe an antidepressant for depression? Because you give insulin for diabetes. So it's a very convincing um, story. The issue is none of that is true. Uh, so another way of thinking about how antidepressants work is what Professor Moncrief calls the drug-centered model, which is thinking about antidepressants as drugs, psychoactive compounds that affect the way that you think and feel. Uh, other psychoactive compounds are caffeine, alcohol. Uh, and what these, what these psychoactive compounds do is they produce effects that are superimposed on existing states, for example, of anxiety, low mood, or, or whatever the mental health issue is. An analogy to this way of understanding is alcohol for social anxiety disorder. Of course, when we drink alcohol, we feel less anxious, but it doesn't change the underlying state. It doesn't fix social anxiety. And no one believes that social anxiety is due to an alcohol deficiency. Uh, if you think about antidepressants, now, why would we think about antidepressants in this way? So this is a slightly full slide. Essentially, to summarize six decades of research into depression, there's no evidence of any difference in, in the neurochemistry of people that are depressed. Uh, certainly no evidence that it's caused by low serotonin. And so it cannot be said that antidepressants fix an underlying imbalance because there is no imbalance there. Um, as an aside, in people's lives, at least 70% of people will get depressed. It's very hard to believe there are abnormal brains in 70% of people. It's a very implausible idea. Uh, there are all sorts of other ideas, biological theories about how antidepressants might, uh, about how depression, uh, how, what, what causes depression how, and how antidepressants might work. You hear stories like it reduces inflammation, it grows new brain cells. All of those are largely derived from animal models. None are proven in humans. And just as an aside, because it's a very popular theory these days, they say that antidepressants grow new brain cells. That's presented as a very positive thing, but it may represent repair uh, of a brain that has been uh, exposed to a, a toxic substance. So for example, when we cut our skin, we grow new skin cells because it's a repair to damage. So the fact that there are new neurons grown in animals exposed to antidepressants may not be a good thing. It may represent uh, a repair mechanism to a toxic, to the introduction of a toxic substance. Uh, so how do antidepressants work? There's a much simpler explanation 
uh, from, from existing data. If you ask people who are on antidepressants, more than half, sometimes three quarters, report that they experience emotional numbing. Uh, that means that their emotions uh, are compressed. What was 10 out of 10 is now three out of 10, and it's for positive and negative emotions. In studies, this, this numbing of emotions correlates with genital numbing. In fact, if you crush up an antidepressant and swish it around your mouth with some water, it will numb your mouth. So uh, numbing seems to be a very broad effect of antidepressants on people. And numbing will tend to reduce people's depression scores in studies. And if you're feeling panicked or depressed or anxious and your levels of anxiety go from a 10 to a 3, it may feel like relief. And that might be useful for people in the, in the short term especially. In the long term, it may have different consequences. It may affect quality of life. It may affect relationships. It may affect positive emotions. It's obviously a very different explanation. If an antidepressant works by numbing your emotions, that's very different to it fixing the underlying chemical imbalance. So I think it's important people understand there are other ways of understanding antidepressants. We also might expect that psychoactive drugs um, that work by numbing may have long-term consequences sleep disruption, concentration and memory problems, worsening mood, all of which are present in long-term antidepressant use. So there may be consequences that are not seen in short-term studies that are present in these longer-term studies. Uh, Felicity already mentioned this. There's been a move away uh, in NICE from antidepressants. This is the guides for GPs for less severe depression and for more severe depression. There are 19 treatments that are as effective as antidepressants in the short term and as cost effective. Uh, and they have uh, some examples are exercise therapies. Problem solving therapy actually is the number one most cost effective treatment for depression. I think that's very telling because, you know, it's the problems in people's lives that make them feel anxious and depressed. And that came out even in NICE's uh, analysis. Uh, actually, the GPs and clinicians on the NICE committee decided that problem-solving therapy was too um, unfamiliar to doctors, and they elected to knock up antidepressants to number one along with CBT because it was more familiar. So it was a cultural choice to knock down problem-solving therapy. Uh, in, this, in this guidance, adverse effects was not taken into account. And of course, there's many more adverse effects to antidepressants than there is to problem-solving therapy, exercise, or mindfulness. And long-term outcomes were also not looked at because there's less data. We know that in the long term, therapy produces better outcomes than antidepressants, although they have similar effects in the short term. And that's because antidepressants wear off, but therapy is about learning skills, uh, about navigating life and your emotions that people can uh, act on and improve over time. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about why stop antidepressants. I know I don't have much time left, so I'll say it very briefly. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons to stop antidepressants. Medication may long, no longer be needed. The stressor has resolved to put you in that spot. People develop alternative coping skills. People are on these drugs for longer than even guidelines recommend. Or, or simply someone wants to stop. Why would that be a good idea? It may improve their quality of life. We know that more than half of people on antidepressants will have sexual side effects that can have big implications for their relationships. We know it can cause emotional numbing. That may be, in fact, how the drugs work. It can give people a, a renewed sense of life coming off them. We know all the following are common in, in people on long-term antidepressants. Fatigue, uh, impaired memory, impaired concentration, weight gain, sleep disturbance, and some people in the long term will develop worsening depression and anxiety, which people think may be due to the antidepressants themselves. There are no long-term studies on the health outcomes of being on antidepressants. So we only have observational studies where, we, where people look at people who are either on or off antidepressants. In these studies, people who are on antidepressants compared to those who are not have an increased risk of strokes, obesity, falls, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and even dying early. There is debate about whether this is caused by depression or anxiety or the medications, but I think there's a good argument that at least some of this increase in risk is due to the antidepressants themselves 
And there's even more reasons in older people who are more prone to the side effects of these drugs to cut them out. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize the rest of my talk in a couple of minutes, which is the one of the big barriers to coming off antidepressants is withdrawal symptoms. Withdrawal symptoms can involve low mood, anxiety, uh, and uh, all sorts of psychological effects. It's extremely easy to mix up those symptoms with a return of your condition of anxiety or depression. Both doctors mix it up as well as patients. It's because there's been incredibly poor education on this topic to doctors. Doctors are focused on spotting relapse and not on spotting withdrawal. One of the consequences of that is there are a series of websites online where hundreds of thousands of people go to get advice on how to stop antidepressants because they've been misdiagnosed by their GP or psychiatrist as having relapse, a return of their condition rather than withdrawal. Uh, what we've worked out over the last few years, so there's a few different ways to distinguish these symptoms. Um, withdrawal tends to come on more quickly than relapse, but it can be delayed, which can make things quite confusing. There are also specific physical symptoms that come along with withdrawal, things like dizziness, electric shock sensations, or really any symptoms that were not present in an underlying condition. So for example, if someone goes on an antidepressant because they're lethargic, they're depressed after the death of their mother, and when they come off their antidepressant three years later, they have panic attacks, they can't sleep, they're very anxious, it's much more likely they've developed common withdrawal symptoms, anxiety, panic attacks, trouble sleeping, rather than they've coincidentally developed a new mental health condition that just happens to coincide with stopping the drugs. So doctors need to have a high index of suspicion for withdrawal effects. Uh, often when you restart the drug, especially if you do it soon after people have stopped, withdrawal symptoms will go away very quickly. It takes longer normally for a relapse. That's one way of understanding the difference. Another point I should make is relapse, I would, I would problematize. People get depressed when things happen in their lives often, divorce, job loss, uh, illness. It's very hard to have a relapse of divorce, possible, but not, not likely. And so when people think about a return of conditions, I'm not sure that most people who are diagnosed with depression really have lifelong relapsing remitting conditions like asthma. So I think the idea of relapse is itself a bit of a flaky idea and withdrawal we know is very common. So I think rather than uh, withdrawal being the zebra and relapse being the horse, it's the other way around. When you hear hoof beats, I think people should be thinking about withdrawal. Uh, I'll just I'll just say my, how do you stop antidepressants safely? I'll say it in, in, in one sentence. Basically you do it slowly. Months is, is better than weeks. Sometimes people need years. You do it at a rate people can tolerate and you need to take into one uh, issue with the neurobiology of how antidepressants work, which is this is citalopram acting on the brain. This is its effect on the brain, the serotonin transporter. And the key issue here is very tiny doses have very large effects. So 20 milligrams is the most common uh, prescribed dose. Just two milligrams actually has about half the effect of 20 milligrams. And so when, when doctors often go down by, they go 20, uh, 10, 5, the first reduction is not too bad, second reduction not too bad, the final reduction from 5 to 0 causes huge trouble for people because it's a, it's a much bigger change in effect on the brain. And so what people need to do to come off slowly is, is to reduce by doses that produce equal amounts of effect on the brain and that involves going down by smaller and smaller amounts down to very small final doses. Doctors often need to use liquids to do that. This is all summarized in a document from the Royal College of Psychiatrists called Stopping Antidepressants. Uh, so if doctors want to learn more about it, that's a very good and short, uh, simply written guide on how to stop antidepressants. Uh, and if you stop them more slowly at a rate people can tolerate and go down very slowly at the end, more people can come off than with the usual halve and half again approach. Uh, here's some examples of what longer tapers look like uh, in the Royal College guidance uh, involving liquids. Here's a very long taper uh, looking at a drug that's very hard to come off like paroxetine. 
The same would be true for things like penlafaxine. Uh, and uh, this is now in the new NICE guidance. So NICE guidance was updated last year and it explains how to do this in quite simple language, but it's now there in the NICE guidelines. People need to do fiddlier things like use liquids in order to make these reductions uh, easier. And uh, we have set up a clinic in our uh, uh, hospital in London, Northeast London NHS Foundation Trust at Good Maze Hospital, where we help people to stop antidepressants. We take them through the process I've just outlined. We do it, we do it gradually. We do it very slowly at the end. We give people more support during the process. We get GPs in the area to prescribe a lot of liquids. Um, we have peer support groups. We have a we have a, they can contact me in between appointments in case things go amiss. And in this way, uh, three quarters of the people we've seen have gotten off at least three quarters of their drugs. Some have some have stopped them. Some have stopped more than one drug, uh, and all of them have failed with their GPs previously in doing it more quickly. And we're also educating GPs and pharmacists in the area. And we, we hope to extend this clinic to national referrals so we can help more people and also uh, give more education to local GPs, which I'm very uh, enthusiastic about. Uh, and there are other people who are copying what we're doing, which is great. And so we hope this will be more widely available uh, over the next few years. I'll, I'll end there. Uh, thanks very much. Um, these are, I'm on Twitter and that's my email if anyone has any further questions. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you uh, to um, all the speakers, Felicity, uh, Debbie and Ralph. So we've got some questions that have come through um, on the chat through um, throughout your presentation. So I'm just going to pick out a few. And Felicity, I think the first one is for you and it's about um, is the online training available and free to access for other GP practices? Thanks, Elsa. I, it will be, yes, um, absolutely. We, The intention right from the outset was that the training would be free and readily available um, to any GP practices who wanted to use it. Um, what we're just trying to figure out at the moment is how we do that. Um, whether or not we um, go through the sort of mandatory training route and get it out that way so that it goes into a large number of practices. That is one route that's available to us, but everybody hates mandatory training, so it might not be the best route for this. So we're exploring other options. And we're actually, after this seminar today, we're having a, a team meeting to think through this in a bit more depth. Um, and we have whether we go to, to get the resources accredited and so forth. But if anybody wants access to the materials now, um, if, if you just drop me a line, I'll put my email in the in the um, chat. We'll, we'll start a sort of contact list of people who want access to it and then we will make it available to you um, whilst we're deciding what to do with it more generally. Yes. Thank you, Felicity. I'm, I'm gonna stick with you again with a question. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you, sorry. Well, uh, unmuting is helpful. Um, so thank you, Felicity. And um, I was just saying, um, someone has asked whether we know um, the staff who undertook the, in, undertook the training, do we know whether they've taken action via the General Medical Council um, to highlight the impact of government policies on the population that they're working with? for example, looking to prevent mental distress related to poverty? That has never been raised in any of the discussions we had, as far as I'm aware. Um, Ilsa, Jane, Catherine, you, those of you in the room who did some of the training as well, if you know different, please say, but no, my impression was that it was something that was never raised by anybody that I came across in the training. Thank you. Um, and there was a question about whether there are plans for a randomized control trial to test the intervention. Um, it's it's something that we're sort of thinking about. I'm a social scientist by background, so randomized control trials are not really me. Um, I think it's something that we are aware that it's, it might be a possibility. I think 
to start with, what we actually want to do is a bit more in-depth research, um, sort of case study research within some of the practices to find out how practice teams are working and how people go down particular referral routes and to follow some patients through to see what's uh, what they're being referred into, what's helpful to them and so on, because I think we have so little information about that at the moment um, that, that that's sort of where we're thinking of focusing the next bit of work. But that's not to say that there wouldn't at a later stage be a broader study that was more, was more along the RCT sort of route. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to read a slightly longer one now. They said, it would be good to hear about how GPs found the, those consults where they tried the approach and it ended up going off in another direction. You mentioned time pressures and cultural differences, but I'm wondering if there's any other barriers GPs identified to using this approach. Um, sorry, I'm just reading the question. Um, so, yeah, no, that, I mean, that wasn't really raised that much in the interviews, but there were, there, I, I, one jumped into my mind where someone says they did ask somebody about their personal circumstances, and um, I think they pressed a bit on, on finances, and uh, they said that they, they, they didn't quite get the reaction that they had hoped for, However, they felt that the consultation went well and that uh, it, it really emboldened them to ask those kinds of questions that before they hadn't felt comfortable or able to ask. Um, I'm not sure what else I can say right now on, on that. Let me think on that one a bit more. Okay. I've just, I've um, picked another question from the chat because um, I empathise with them, they're looking to recruit GPs to a, a study um, and they're wondering if they if we have any advice for them on recruitment of GPs specifically. <laughs> um, well, I have, at this point, I have to commend the amazing research team for their perseverance on this project. We started the project during COVID when trying to access GP surgeries was unbelievably difficult for all mm. of the obvious reasons. It's It's... It remained difficult throughout the project, um, and you know we know primary care is under so much pressure. It's a very difficult space to work in. I think for us, um, finding links in, having a personal contact, or just sort of finding the name of somebody to contact within a practice helps. If you if you email just to a generic email address, you won't get a response. I think it was very helpful for us to be able to identify practice managers or a particular GP who we knew was interested in health inequalities. And um, that that helped, I think. Um, we worked through the, um, um, the CRNs, Clinical Research Networks. That wasn't particularly helpful in stage one, um, but it was much more helpful in stage two where we worked with CRNs from across England and they helped to identify the practices that we needed. Um, so that is a is quite a good route to, to try. Um, and you can build the costs for that into a research bid. So I would strongly recommend thinking about doing that. Um, and if, if, if you wanted to carry on that discussion um, online, feel free to drop an email um, to me and we can, yeah, I can talk you through what we did if that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so someone says many of the systemic and organizational structures and culture limit implementation of broader ways of practicing beyond biomedical approaches. Have you got any suggestions on how to support clinicians working within these systems? It kind of, it makes me think of that mind map that we developed because we had a box in there that was what is within the GP's control and what is, <laughs> what is without, because we wanted to acknowledge the huge challenges that uh, they're facing just because of the system that they're in. Um, yeah, and I think we were critically aware of that and the pressures that people are under. But so I think it's about, you know, it's about small changes. It's about not necessarily seeing antidepressants as sort of the initial go-to in a first consultation. And a lot of GPs wouldn't do that anyway. Um, but, but, but actually introducing some of the more 
you know, I guess having a slightly more open conversation with people about those limitations and 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 raising patient awareness because I think you know a lot of patients don't know how effective medications are or aren't for them and a lot of people still see health professionals um, as the people that do know um, and I mean actually what we found was quite a lot of confusion on both sides actually in terms of what was being prescribed and why it was being prescribed and how helpful that was or wasn't to people. Um, so, you know, what we were trying to do was just those slightly smaller shifts way in, in introducing a discussion around broader circumstances rather than necessarily going for the prescribing route. Um, so, so the training materials have got little scripts in them that people can try and, and, and looking at the patient feedback we got, it focused so heavily on how much people appreciated feeling listened to you know time and time again in the responses we got people said i felt listened to i felt heard and we didn't ask anybody to say that but it was the, the theme that kept coming up so it's it's a sort of small going back to basic sort of simple things i think um i'm not sure if that uh really answers the question but um you know we, we recognize that people are working in these very difficult circumstances so it's possibly just about sort of shifting the emphasis of the consultation um, to try and have that broader discussion in the first place to try and understand really what the issue is because some you know quite often it's not what people think it is, and I think our you know the community partners have covered that really well and what they were telling us about why they went to a GP and what they were expecting and then kind of didn't necessarily come out with. Um, so I think it's about sort of everybody rethinking what that space is for in those contexts. Thanks, Felicity. I will take you out of the, the spotlight for now, because um, there is a question, um, I assume, directly for Mark. So someone says, in my psychology undergrad, we were taught that SSRIs work by making it more likely people will experience a sense of reward when engaged in activities they previously found meaningful and rewarding. They want to know, is there evidence for this? And also a broader question, can we ever justify the prescription of antidepressants in mild to moderate depression? Uh, good, good questions. Um, there are, uh, I don't know the exact studies you're talking about, there are different studies in animals and humans that look at giving people antidepressants, what happens after uh, in the first few days. There are studies that find that people respond sometimes less to negative words like disgust and anger, and sometimes more, uh, sometimes uh, the reverse for um, uh, positive words so there's sort of a mixed literature there but the finding in long-term studies is the opposite is 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 that emotional blunting is that people feel um they have less response to uh things around them people often describe themselves as feeling foggy which is sort of a combination of uh cognitive impairment memory and concentration issues not being as clear on what their emotions are when people stop antidepressants what I hear from people again and again is I can think more clearly and I feel more clearly. You know, as they sometimes people will say that I get their gut instinct back. Um, so I don't know the exact symptom. I don't know the exact experiments that you're talking about, but the, the long-term story in humans is the opposite of what, what, what you've said. Um, the broader question on should we be prescribing antidepressants in mild to moderate depression? I mean, I showed you that the, the effects are extremely small. They're probably exaggerated by a whole range of methodological tricks that drug companies use. There is a whole range of side effects, including on emotions, um, uh, nausea, uh, changes to sleep, changes to concentration. There's a whole possibility that they're causing long-term uh, cardiovascular and, uh, and, and, and stroke issues. Um, they're very hard to stop. I didn't talk about the data on how common it is, but half the people will have withdrawal symptoms, probably a quarter will have severe trouble stopping. So there is not much benefit, a yeah. lot of harms. And as I quickly showed in the NICE guidelines, there are 19 alternatives that are as effective, as cost-effective and with less harms. Um, so I think given all those things, it's very hard to justify using antidepressants in mild to moderate depression. Thanks, Mark. I can see that Ralph and Debbie have a hand up. 
I just want to like reiterate what Mark just said. There's lots of um, alternatives that have positive side effects rather than negative. And a lot of those are based on human interaction. So as society becomes fragmented, we all talk about social media and people being consumed in the online, online world. I read about a study, and I think it was Zimbabwe, where there wasn't much mental health infrastructure. They have a community bench where people know that if you're sitting on the bench, you need to talk about mental health. And I also wanted to address the controversial question that was that there is a role for psychiatrists in mental health, but I think Mark will concur that it's a role that needs to evolve based on these findings. And I just wanted to say that we can create an enemy of psychiatry or GPs or people in poverty that are a stigmatized problem in society but actually this project is taught that if people work together across disciplines and fields we'll find a holistic approach combining all of those skill sets together thank you ralph what a good note to end on <laughs> i don't think in the last few minutes we're going to get to um, a decent response to any of the, the other questions. Did Was there something uh, final from you, Felicity or Mark, that you wanted to add? Um, no, I, I think, I think I, I've spoken enough today, Lisa, thank you. I just, I just want to use this opportunity again, just to say a huge thank you to everybody who's been involved in the project because it's been, such an amazing experience and I think we've learned a huge amount so I look forward to seeing what, what comes next for the project um, and thank you everybody who's joined us today it's brilliant to have so many interested people listening um, to what we've had to say thank you for coming <laughs>